In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, so welcome to week two of our sermon series on the book, Love is the Way, by our presiding bishop, Michael Curry. Today we're considering chapters four through six, where his, uh, his reflection on the power of love gets a little more personal for us. Bishop Curry moves from asking, you know, can love really change the world, to asking, I'm just a regular person. Can my love have an impact? You know, I think, at least, if we ask ourselves, what can I do to change the world? You know, most of us will pretty much stop dead in our tracks. But, but if we ask ourselves, who can I be for the people around me? Well, maybe we can live into an answer to that one. I, I think Bishop Curry would say that we are nothing less than God's conduits, delivering the power of love that gives itself away. And going down that road, we're following in the footsteps of some unlikely world changers. In our first reading today, we eavesdrop on Abram and God, who've already talked twice before this story. Earlier, God promised children to Abram, and, and a woman that he held in slavery had born their son, Ishmael. Well, I, you know, that's one way to make good on the promise of descendants, but but it wasn't really the answer Abram was looking for. So now in this reading, God formalizes that promise by making a covenant with Abram and his wife, Sarai. God says, you shall not just be the ancestor of a nation, Abram. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. And to mark this pivot point in history, God gives the two of them new names. Abram, the exalted ancestor, becomes Abraham, the ancestor of a multitude. And Sarai becomes Sarah, meaning princess. These new names, they mark a turn in the lives of these characters. They won't just change the future for their nation. They'll change the future for peoples yet to come. And then, of course, we hear from Jesus in the Gospel reading, the, the Son of God taking a path that even his chief lieutenant thinks is crazy. So, a little context helps. After a section of Mark's Gospel where Jesus has been healing people and walking on water and confronting the religious leaders and feeding thousands, Jesus now drops the news his followers least expected that his path to bringing in the reign and rule of God goes through Calvary. There's a cross awaiting him, and <laughs> not just him. If any want to become my followers, Jesus says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. <laughs> and off to the side is Peter saying, wait a minute, Jesus. We, we, thought, we thought we were heading to glory. We thought we were changing the world. Now you're telling us we got to give up everything, give up our lives in the hope that things will get better later. Well, Abraham and Jesus are, are both playing the long game. They're, they're both practitioners of the spirituality of tomorrow. Or as Bishop Curry might say, they're both seed planters. You know, Abraham is never going to see the nations that will rise as his descendants. And Jesus is willing to be the seed himself, that, that grain of wheat that dies in order to bear the fruit of eternal life. And his followers, like Peter and Andrew and all the rest, you know, they, they then take the promise of the kingdom on the road to the Roman world and beyond, denying themselves without seeing the end of the story they're preaching. Well, let me, let me tell you about some other practitioners of the spirituality of tomorrow, other folks who are good at playing the long game of God's kingdom. 
As you know, we've, just this past week, we've begun a, a Lenten class in civil discourse. And our leader of that, Ann Rainey, asked the 25 or so people on the Zoom call to say briefly why they were there. And many of their responses reflected frustration with conversations and social media and culture now, as well as class members' grief that they, they just can't stay in relationship with friends or family who say objectionable things. But along with this frustration and grief, I heard some shared faith that, that the act of offering themselves for this experience might be the start of a change. And when we change and apply what we learn, we change the world around us. And, and part of that is about how we see the people of the world around us. You know, in, in Bishop Curry's book, he quotes a, a Jewish proverb that says, before every person there marches an angel proclaiming, behold, the image of God. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu has asked, you know, if we took that notion seriously, that all people were made in God's image and likeness, what would we do? Well, we would bow to every person we meet, even those whose points of view we can't abide. And I think in trying to build that skill, the, the folks in the civil discourse class are playing the long game practicing the spirituality of tomorrow. So here's another example. A, a community leader profiled in last Sunday's Kansas City Star, Alvin Brooks. Now, if you've been around Kansas City any length of time, you know that name. Alvin Brooks grew up here in the 1930s and 40s in a world of strict segregation, something he learned directly as a boy when he and some white friends walked into a drugstore on the border between a black and a white neighborhood in Kansas City and ordered themselves cherry Cokes. Fine, except the white druggist made him take his Coke in a paper cup out onto the sidewalk. Since then, Brooks has made it his life's work to bring people together to confront and upend injustice. He did that as, uh, as one of a handful of black police officers here in the 1960s. In fact, once he was hanged in effigy, called the N-word, and threatened, told to go home. Fellow police officers cut down the effigy and took it back to the station and set it at a desk, thinking that was funny. Brooks's father asked him, why in the world he would want to be a police officer here, saying, you know, you, you know how they treat us. But Brooks said his thought was that he would show them how to be a better cop. And from there, Brooks served on school district, with the school district, served as the city's director of human relations and as assistant city manager, served on the board of police commissioners and on the city council and became mayor pro tem. And maybe most significantly, he founded the ad hoc group against crime, which for decades has provided crisis intervention and crime prevention, supporting families affected by violence. In all this, he has pushed against seemingly immovable forces, but he's done it Jesus style. Here's how one of our city's greatest religious leaders, the, the Reverend Wallace Hartsfield, described Brooks. He said, Alvin deliberately takes up the pain of others. He doesn't have to do that. He has his own pain. But he has surrendered his life for others, and that is the secret to his strength. Alvin Brooks has spent decades changing the world one life at a time. Well, here's another example. A Kansas City leader from a newer generation, a younger generation, Natasha Kirsch. Now, you, you know her work if, like me, you take your dog to the grooming project. 
Natasha created the grooming project and the organization behind it, Empower the Parent to Empower the Child, or EPIC. And most of you, you've heard about EPIC and its, its training program where single moms can learn a profession, dog grooming, that actually pays a living wage. And it's worked so well that its dog grooming facility is now expanding and EPIC is building apartments for students who need housing as they go through the program. But Natasha's gift, at least among Natasha's gifts, is that she figured out how to use the world as she found it to change women's lives. I mean, you know, many people in our culture, honestly, probably care more about their dogs than they care about hungry people on the street or about moms who don't earn a living wage. That is not good, and we need to keep moving away from our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice, as we prayed on Ash Wednesday. And at the same time, Natasha looked at the fact that I am willing to fork over 40 bucks or so to get Petey groomed, and she figured out how to use that to train a mom for a job that'll pay her a living wage. Natasha is changing the world one life at a time. Well, here's a final example of someone playing the long game and practicing the spirituality of tomorrow. I know a businessman here at St. Andrews who politically has a pretty conservative bent. He, he finds that approach to public policy works best for his small business. He also invests himself in the people who work for him. In fact, he intentionally hires people of color and people with sketchy histories. And then he takes the time to get to know them, learning their stories, learning their gifts, guiding them when he can. Now, I, I don't know whether he would frame it like this, but I would say that by taking his employees so seriously, he is seen in each worker the image and likeness of God. And as a result, their lives improve. And, by the way, his business benefits because his workers know he's invested in them. That's changing the world one life at a time. Okay, so where do these examples point? I think they flesh out our story. As, as Bishop Curry says, to pray and to work for the way things could be, that's the hard way of love. And their story can be your story too, a narrative really that any of us can step into. In fact, it's a narrative we're each called to step into in our own ways. You can change the world because you have the two fundamental capacities required for it. First, you are made in the image and likeness of God, filled with power to accomplish God's purposes. And second, you can make the choice to recognize that divinity in everybody else around you. You can invest yourself in real, live human beings who also bear God's image and likeness. Now, for a few of us, that happens by leading a movement or starting a nonprofit. But, but it also happens by putting yourself out there to serve someone who needs justice or just needs a second chance. And, I would say, it happens through your engagement in our democracy when the way you vote seeks solutions, progressive or conservative solutions, that share this priority, putting first the well-being of the folks who get the short end of the stick. That's the test. But I guarantee you that you can change the world by being the person you are, living into the the identity, the new name that God gave you in baptism. If you have come through those baptismal waters, 
you share in the power, in the spirit, of the incarnate God who changed the world by giving his life for the people around him, even the ones who don't deserve it, which is all of us. You have the capacity to set your mind on divine things, not on human things, practicing the love that gives itself away by changing one life at a time. It's the gospel of the long game. You, you may not see the harvest, but you're called to plant the seeds. And as Bishop Curry says, even though the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, the second best time is now.